to start off, I'm very excited for uh, Tommaso Poggio to be joining us. Um, Tommaso has been working, uh, contributing to our understanding of this problem for a long time now. He is a Eugene McDermott professor at the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences at MIT, as well as the uh, CSAIL, uh, <coughs> CSAIL section, um, and the director of Center of Biological and Computational Learning. Um, he's won a number of awards, including the Gabor Award, the Osaka Award, Oka Okawa Award, and the Schwartz Prize. Um, and uh, he'll be telling us about dynamics and generalization in deep neural nets. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm actually now director of the Center for Brains, Minds, and Machines, which is a science and technology center <laughs> of NSF between uh, um, MIT, Harvard, and a few other places with about 20 faculty in different disciplines of neuroscience, cognitive science, and uh, computer science. Um, I would like to speak today about uh, some topics in deep neural networks. So I kind of wasted my the last three years working on this. And uh, you all know about uh, uh, the kind of neural networks I'm going to speak deep um, with RLUs and typically optimized with an exponential loss function, not square loss. Turns out exponential loss function are probably easier to handle theoretically. And they're also the ones that people use mostly for classification, which is where deep networks have seen their best success stories. So uh, let me start, and I will be quick, with uh, approximation theory. In general, in a learning problem, you'd like to uh, consider you know, three, four parts. One is approximation theory, another is optimization, and in a sense, the most interesting one is generalization. So um, the first one is really about the power of the representations, and more specifically, why are um, deep networks, why and when are deep networks better, and in which sense, than shallow networks. And shallow networks are linear classifier, support vector machines, um, radial basis functions, all these techniques that can be represented with a single hidden layer. Um, often uh, the situation is that the, these weights are not learnable, that you don't need to train them, and only the outputs one are, like in support vector machines. Um, and on the right, you have networks of the deep um, learning types. Um, um, and, and so it, it is well known since the 80s, and this was part of the reason why deep networks were not studied very much then, is that from the point of view of function approximation of representing continuous function on a compact domain, multidimensional, shallow networks of that type are universal. Assuming that the nonlinearity phi um, is not a polynomial. Okay, and this was all the results, Sibenko among others, but many others, and essentially a, a virus trust like type theorems for uh, nonlinear one layer networks. So, no reason to have deep networks from this point of view of approximating continuous function. However, um, both shallow and deep networks um, looked as approximation techniques uh, suffer from the so called curse of dimensionality, a term invented by Bellman that basically says that the number of parameters that you need to get an approximation in the order of epsilon of a target function, say in the soup norm, for instance, <coughs> the order of parameters you, you need is exponential in the dimensionality. So for instance, if epsilon is 10% error and d is eight dimension, you have 10 to the eight parameters in the order. And if d instead of um, eight or is uh, something like uh, 1,000 or 1 million pixels in an image, then these numbers become truly very, very big. Okay, so there is one class of uh, functions for which deep networks, but not shallow networks, can escape the curse of dimensionality. 
And this, um, these are functions that have a structure like the one shown there, are compositional functions, are functions of functions of functions, where the constituent functions have a low dimensionality, in this case, two. So the graph you see there um, is a graph of the function, uh, is a binary tree, oops, sorry. Okay. It's a binary tree, and so you can imagine each node is one of these G. Uh, so this is a function of two variables. So you build a function of eight variables out of functions of two variables. And if a function has this representation, then a deep, the complexity of a deep network with a similar architecture um, needs a number of parameters that is linear in D instead of exponential in D. Okay. And convolutional networks are networks of this type with the additional property that they have shared weights, which in this notation means that all the G function at one level are the same function. All these are the same, and all these are the same. Interestingly, um, it's not sharing weights that uh, reduces the dimensionality from exponential to linear, but it's the locality of the com constituent functions. You don't need share weight to go from exponential to linear. Okay. So um, that's the story. The proof is pretty simple. Um, and let me skip it. And we did tests of, uh, on CIFAR, for instance, uh, checking this kind of uh, results. I will not uh, spend time on it. Um, there are some... Um, interesting philosophical argument one could uh, um, discuss because it happens, it seems that some of the problems we're really interested in, like images and text and speech, are compositional in this sense. And it, the intuition is that these are all problems where we don't need you know, to have a pixel interacting with another pixel at the other extreme of the image. We can make local computation and aggregate this local computation together. And this is true for text, speech, and images. Um, uh, but why does, come, does this come about? Some people like my um, colleague Max Tegmark thinks is because of the locality of the Hamiltonians of physics. Uh, I think it's more perhaps because um, the brain may be more like a deep network, so the problems we can solve are like these compositional problems, or these are the problems we're interested in. But anyway, that's philosophy, open problem. Okay, let me come to the more interesting part of the talk about uh, deep networks and uh, um, uh, why, despite over-parameterization, they do pretty well on um, a test set. And uh, we all know about gradient descent. And I'll take the view here um, of dynamical systems. So gradient flow, uh, forgetting about discretization and learning rates and so on. I analyze this as a dynamical systems induced by the gradient on the loss function. And the loss function I'm going to consider is the exponential loss function as a proxy for um, exponential functions, uh, exponential loss functions like the cross entropy, which are typically used in training um, deep networks for classification. And so um, this, the, the loss function here um, in the binary case uh, has labels that are plus one or minus one, and the F is the network, which can be positive or negative. Uh, you have a matrix of weights for each layer from 1 to k. And xn is your <coughs> input, vector of inputs. yn is the um, label. Uh, and this is your training set. And you're looking for uh, minimizing this, <coughs> this loss. Uh, of course, if yn and f of xn 
have the same sign, so you are correct, then the exponent is positive and the, the, you pay a low price. Okay? If they are incorrect, it's, uh, this, sorry, this exponent, the exponent is, the whole exponent is negative, and so you have e to the minus something negative. If you are wrong, it's positive, possibly large. Okay, so um, that's uh, um, the dynamical system. Um, there are many weights that I label ij for each layer k. And uh, um, the problem I want really to go after is this uh, um, phenomenon of resistance to overparameterization. This is CIFAR, and this is keeping the training data set fixed at 50,000 examples, CIFAR 10. Um, uh, the 10 class problems, and when uh, the number of model weights uh, gets increased, um, you see that the training error gets around zero when you get into the regime of as many parameters as data or more parameters than data. You fit the data, um, but the test error um, does not get worse even if you increase the number of parameters by order of magnitudes. And why is that? Typically, in, uh, um, in uh, learning theory, we want to have some guarantee that uh, um, we learn a function that can predict um, after being chosen or trained with a training set can predict well for future inputs. And these problems of learning is a prototype, typical problem of an ill post problem, because we are really sampling uh, functions. And, uh, and, uh, and so you want to ensure that the solution to such a problem um, can exist unique and in a stable way. Um, and one way to do that is uh, to um, control um, the, the complexity of the function that you are going to fit or, or to choose from the training set. Um, and this is the same principle that is used in inverse problems to make them well posed. Now, the first observation is that what counts is really not the, the number of parameters or weight, but some other measure of complexity, which is closer to their norm, or some measure of their norm. The, the complexity measure that uh, play a big role in learning theory are uh, VC dimension, uh, Radamacher complex numbers, uh, are, uh, things like covering numbers and so on. Um, and you can control this kind of complexity through controls of appropriate norms. And one way to do that is regularization, like Sanjay mentioned earlier. But the, um, the intriguing point is that, unlike support vector machine, where there is an explicit regularization term in most of, of the situation, in uh, deep networks, there is no explicit regularization. You can have one, but they work well even without it. So how it's possible? Uh, typical regularization term, for instance, in the case of uh, kernel machine will um, be something like this. You are minimizing your training error, uh, but there is also a regularization term that is uh, controlling the complexity measured here as a reproducing caliber space norm of the function f. Now, um, there are, of course, some interesting examples in classical mathematics that I just mentioned, and I'll come back to this later. And um, the point is the Moore Penrose pseudo inverse, which can be seen as the limit of a, regular, a ridge regression, a regularization process, 
in which you're trying to find the inverse of this matrix. And since um, the inverse may not exist, you are adding a regularization term and then taking the limit for lambda going to 0. That's the pseudo inverse. And there is a number of uh, intriguing, very recent papers showing that under favorable data distribution, um, square error, the pseudo inverse can do very well in terms of the expected error, even if it fits the training set at zero error. There are some implications about Wapnick's theory and uh, um, consistency of ERM. I'll come back to that later. Okay, so let's go back to this uh, um, minimization problem for exponential type losses. So the cross entropy would be this one. But, uh, there are a number of um, um, results that show that if we um, uh, consider this for simplicity, we'll get basically the same type of results. Okay, so the puzzle is, uh, is this one. There are more parameters, no explicit norm control or regularization. Uh, a really uh, deep network so fantastic that we can throw away everything we know so far. And uh, uh, for classification, I think the answer turns out is pretty simple. Um, if you think about it, what matters in classification is not F, what you are minimizing, but it is a normalized F. Think of in the linear case, you have F is Wx. Um, and what really matters if w divided by the norm of w, x. Because what matters is the sign. And the sign will be the same for w, x or for w over the norm of w, x. OK? So you can imagine what you're really interested in doing when you do binary classification. You want to find, you run your gradient descent, what people do find F, all the weights, W. But then after done that, that, you have to stop at some point because as I will show, the W grow to infinity in norm. At some point you stop. And now you take the normalized W. And this is what matters. Okay, so, and I'll show you, if you consider the W, the normalized W, Things converge, there is generalization, everything works. First, let me, um, <coughs> this is uh, the usual neural network. So I'm looking at matrix W, uh, RLUs, um, and one important property is that RLU, similar to homogeneous linear function, are homogeneous. Um, this is captured by this relation here. And this means that the neural network, in terms of the W, can be written as F, as rho F tilde, where rho is the product of the norms, say Frobenius norm of each layer, of each matrix of each layer. And where F is the normalized network in the sense that it has, instead of the W for each layer, it has the weights, call it V, normalized by its Frobenius norm of that layer, okay? Um, so, f um, so forget this because that's a notation that, but what is true is that the Frobenius norm of the VK is one and uh, um, what matters for classification, as I mentioned before, in this case, F will have one output is the normalized F, because the sign will be the same. The sign is the only thing that matters, and the sign will be independent of the normalization. 
Okay. Is that clear so far? So now I'm making in the next step a strong assumption, which is empirically correct in many cases, which is that during gradient descent, at some point, I get um, weights, I get a function that is se separates the training set. Separates means that classify correctly all the training data, okay? This usually happens and the intuition is you are over parameterized so you can fit the data. So that's, this would be a big cons constraint if I would restrict my function to be linear because this will be a constraint on the data. But in this case, it's a pretty good assumption. Some point during gradient descent, this happens. Okay, now, um, so let's take again the, the standard simple gradient descent that people do in the case of the exponential loss. And let's ask which kind of dynamics does this impose on the normalized weights? So I change variables going from W to V and rho. Okay, I have to keep it, take into account that the V are normalized in doing, doing so. So there are a, a, a little bit of algebra. And so I end up with a dynamical system with two equations. Instead of one equation W, it's two equations one in the rho and one in the v. These are completely equivalent, the two dynamical systems. Okay, first of all, I can see that the rho, um, if I make the assumption that um, I have separability, this term is positive and this term is positive, so the rho dot is always positive or greater or equal zero. So the rho grows continuously to infinity. For one layer networks, they grow like log of t. For deep networks, they grow um, a bit slower, but the product a bit faster. I can also see that the different layers, I will not show this here, but the rho of the different layers grow in the same way. So the the derivative of rho square k is independent of, of k. Um, and here for the v, I see a dynamics which, you know, has equilibrium points. This is the key part. This is, in fact, an hyperbolic dynamical system. You can look at the Hessian and it's positive definite for any finite or negative definite anyway. It's a minimum for any um, finite row. Um, and so, and the, the, the argument, I'll, I'll, I'll speak later how this happens, but just looking at this, these are the condition for an equilibrium point, for a stationary point for w, v, v, the time derivative of vk to be zero. And uh, you can see that if uh, the intuition is that as time goes on and rho goes to infinity, the exponential becomes a max operation. It's a sum of exponential and so essentially one of the uh, of the exponential term will survive and the other one will be very small and the one that will survive correspond to a, a support vectors, the one with the, the maximum, um, the, the, um, uh, the, mi the minimum value of f, the smaller value. And so you end up with um, 
one support vector or, or a set of support vectors um, at equilibrium. These are the critical points. Uh, I'll get back to this in more detail. I wanted just to show um, the main point, which is the following. Let's now consider a different dynamical system that comes from having this loss plus a Lagrange multiplier term. And I'll do gradient descent on this. Uh, before I just consider this, this one is um, assuming that I have um, rho k times vk equal wk, but I have not imposed that vk is norm one. I do it through Lagrange multiplier. So lambda is determined by this constraint. And there is a little trick that allows you to compute lambda and then to substitute in. And I get two equations when I do gradient descent on this. And the two equations are here. And uh, when I put everything together, I get two equations that are very similar to the ones I had before without the, this term. Um, there is a row square factor in difference, but um, the, the critical points are the same. And so, and so when I do gradient descent without any constraint, I get the same solutions as if I constrain the V to be normal one. Now, sorry. The constraint is this square equal one. So the constraint, let me see, here is that this is equal one. This determines the value of the lambda. And the lambda are, um, have a particular form that goes to zero as time goes to infinity. But this means that here I have a regularization formulation with a lambda, with the quadratic term. And the solutions of this, the equilibrium points to which this converges, are the same as if I do this and I look at the solutions for the V. So, um, so I can say that the, the one with the Lagrange multiplier does generalize because it's, uh, um, it's a regularization um, technique. Uh, we know the regularization is stable and stability, a certain type of beta stability implies generalization. Um, and so the, also the former must be generalized. Yes? Um, I did not look at bounds. Uh, so um, the, in terms of stability, you have to have um, essentially enough data points. You have to have that one over square root of lambda times n um, is, uh, um, is uh, s small. Yeah, it sounds like you're doing gradient descent on uh, unit square. On, which, yeah. Which is bounded, but still puts a very large square. Um, I can also. Okay. Ah, yeah, just to show what we expect. So with generalization, we expect that the, um, the training loss will converge for a number of data going to infinity to the test loss. Now, if you try the 
training loss, this was uh, CIFR, training loss um, is here, and the test loss exponential in both cases is here, and it's a mess, right? However, if you take the same data points, these are different, um, I should explain, these are different networks initialized in a different way with different um, random, um, so the, the weights were initialized, uh, picking them randomly from a Gaussian and uh, as other people have observed, if you're Gaussian is bigger, uh, a bigger initialization gives you networks that have a worse test error, although the training error may be zero. So we did that for various networks, and you have a variety of networks in terms of test, test error. Um, um, the training loss is, is it's very small. Um, this is 10 to the minus 3. Now, taking the, exactly the same networks, same data, but you now compute, instead of the F for each point, the F tilde. So you normalize each of these network by the product of the norms of the, their weight matrices. The plot you get is this one. Yeah, one second. This means, so th this would be um, training loss equal to test loss plus a small offset, which would correspond to the Radamacher complexity plus some other terms. Yes? It's interesting the scale. You, you have previously 10 to the minus 3 that was training loss. Uh, in the previous one. Yeah. And then the test was zero, seven. Yeah. That means classification. It's not classification. This is cross entropy. Oh, that's the cross entropy. Cross entropy, yeah. You, you know, you. So what, so what, so how many? Cipher, 10 classes, 50,000 example and so on. Yeah. So, you know, you train, it's a separate discussion. You train on the, the cross entropy laws. The best you can expect is generalization to the cross entropy laws. If you go to classification, is another step. Which so now, now the scale changes. Yeah. Training. Yeah. Okay. You are, uh, the output of the network is much smaller. It's, you know, so you have a larger number for the loss. Interestingly, you know, this is a, a dot that correspond to uh, this was mentioned a couple of times. There was this uh, paper by Chi Wan Zhang. He was one of my students. That he um, this wor was work not done with me, but at Google, um, he had uh, um, CIFAR and uh, randomly labeled data, and uh, the networks can fit the data, but of course he cannot generalize. Right? If we put this data point we can exactly predict from the training error of the normalized network how bad or well the, the, that will do. So whereas in the standard situation, you know, you have perfect training performance, you cannot predict how it will do in test. If you look at the normalized network, you can. So what you saw there is a typical it's not unexpected, it's a typical generalization bound where you have the, the expected error on the exponential cross entropy loss. Um, you know, it's very close to the training loss for the normalized network, because this term, which would be the Radamacher complexity of the normalized network, that turns out to be small, and these are numbers that are small because of large training set. So these are other examples of the same figure. This is the randomly labeled set in CIFAR. Um, 
Yeah, it could be larger. This is. Um, so there are the macro complexity um, uh, scales with the norm. So if you, in our case, with our networks, with the norm equal one, because we have norm one in all layers, the normalized com turns out to be small. But um, Okay, uh, let's see, what is the time? Uh, 20. 20 minutes more? Okay, so just to give you uh, more detail on, uh, um, on what I did is uh, the following. You can consider this um, uh, minimization and the gradient system that comes out of this, and the first step you can do is to fix rho, and so the gradient is just with respect to the vk, um, and uh, um, since you are a fixed rho, you are on the sphere, you are in a compact domain, the minimum exists, and for v dot equals zero, and assuming separability, you have the, this equation, which is valid for a given row. You can look at the Hessian of this dynamical system. You find this uh, minima are hyperbolic, so it's a stable. Um, the Hessian is right here. Um, as I mentioned before, the row grow the various, the norms of the various layers grow similarly, then you can show that in the limit, um, you converge the, the system now uh, for rho going to infinity, converge to the maximum margin, which correspond to the minimum norm solution. So, uh, this is the support vector, which is, has the smallest values among the data point. And uh, um, and so th the solution to which you converge at infinity are minimum norm solution of each of the um, matrices of coefficient. They are somewhat similar to the pseudo-inverse solutions that I've seen before, but for any finite time, which means any finite row, um, uh, you are in the regime in which uh, the minimum, strictly speaking, is hyperbolic. I say strictly speaking because it may be, um, you may be in, uh, um, um, in a, with a very small potential valley relative to the noise. It's, it's like this, <laughs> you know, it's a stable minimum. As opposed to, for instance, a degenerate minimum, which is flat. The curvature is, is positive, right? The Hessian is positive in every direction. So, by the way, when you have a hyperbolic minima, you can also linearize a nonlinear system. There are a lot of things you can do if you if you have not in hyperbolic minima, but you have to be very careful. Okay, and uh, and as I said, the main the main point is that the standard gradient descent, no regularization term, no Lagrange multiplier, um, converges to the same. Um, equilibrium point as the dynamical system in which you have the Lagrange multiplier, the regularization term. Um, that's the one which uh, allows us to say that uh, the solution must generalize at finite time, at finite row. Um, um, 
The same statements hold exactly for weight normalization. Uh, for batch normalization, there are a couple other differences that makes the statement a little bit more complicated, but it should behave somewhat similarly to weight normalization. Um, the weight normalization dynamics are exactly the same as the Lagrange multiplier one. Um, and uh, of course, there are limitations in what I said because I cannot tell you about uh, the classification error. There is a gap here. I can tell you about generalization in terms of the cross entropy loss, but then if you have to to say how, much, how good or bad the classification error is, uh, I don't know how to do that. There's a bound. Sorry? There's a bound on the yeah, there is a loss. Right, there is a bound, but it's in our case it's so loose that it does not say much. Yeah. yeah, I know that the exponential loss in upper bound of the classification error, but yeah, but it does not give us much. <laughs> Uh, anyway, th th this is work to be done. For linear networks, we can, for instance, also compute the rate of convergence. Uh, so this would be one layer linear networks. Uh, the rate of convergence, both for um, the standard gradient descent and also um, for weight normalization, which turn out to be much faster. This is in the case of having, um, at some point, one support vector. So it's a very sim simplified case, but we could verify the prediction in, uh, uh, with computer simulation. Um, and this was computed also, this one by Zrebro um, a few years ago. Um, so a summary of the results is that uh, assuming separability, then we have that gradient descent converges to a normalized solution that generalizes and uh, you have these various facts. You have that uh, uh, the dynamics of the V converges to uh, stationary point of the flow. These are hyperbolic minima. Um, if you uh, do the, normal, the, the gradient descent under this constraint, you convert to the same stationary um, point. Um, um, these uh, convergence points are maximum of the margin, minimum norm solutions. Um, the st standard deep networks converge to this, uh, weight and normalization correspond to the Lagrange multiplier dynamics. And uh, um, yeah, that's it. Essentially repeating what I said. There are a number of open questions. Um, for instance, this is not one global minimum to one you converge. There are many, many minima. And, uh, and we empirically, we know that if you start with small initial conditions, the minima are better in terms of the expected error. We don't know why. We know that the neural tangent kernel situation is a situation in which the initialization is large, and so performance is not as good as it could be. Um, uh, but that, that is all, all part to be sorted out. And it probably has to do um, with understanding better the dynamics before separability is reached. Um, and the extension to regression uh, is not trivial, um, so I, I, I cannot say very much apart from, um, from the fact that there may be some interesting um, exceptions to the so-called fundamental theorem of learning by Vapnik, in which he, uh, he claimed that uh, for ERM, generalization is equivalent to consistency. This means that um, for when you minimize the error, that's the type of algorithm, CRM, then generalization meaning the fact that your, the solution you found by minimizing the error on the training set 
will converge for n going to infinity in terms of error to the test error, to the expected error. This is generalization. And the theorem says that this, th if this is true, then, then uh, uh, consistency follows. In other, in other words, the solution you find with the ERM is the best one for the test. But um, in the case of um, regression, it seems that we have examples now uh, by Sasha Racklin, for instance, Misha Belkin, um, uh, in which they have uh, kernel machine situations that correspond to the pseudo inverse, and they fit the data in the square error, so the test error is zero. Um, but the, uh, sorry, the training error is zero, but the test error is not zero, although it's very good. This would be a case that you don't have generalization, but you probably have consistency. Okay, uh, just so I spoke about these two things and um, um, the main conclusion is that they are not magic, deep networks, and more fundamentally, I think the problem of intelligence is a long way to be solved. So there is much more work to be done. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. So the, the, the part about the regularization of the open norm, is it similar to what we have earlier uh, about the ability to have equivalence of different, uh, different regularization of the learning rate of the weight, uh, although this is this was a mean square error and you are using um, uh, exponential error, but is this the same message or similar? Well, um, what I'm basically saying is that in the case of the exponential error, um, um, because what matters is the normalized network, there is a hidden regularization in your dynamics. So even if there is no explicit regularization that you put at the beginning, the dynamical system behaves as if it is regularized. But, but that would also mean that I could choose another regularization and since the norm, or, or, or that's important that this has the, this, this form of regularization. Well, so, I'm, st I'm just studying what people are doing. And uh, so if people, meaning the, what the practitioner in a deep network use this exponential type loss, and so I find they, that what they, they do is in an implicit way to have a regularization constraint, which is the L2 norm. If you don't have a DL2 norm, then things change, and gradient descent does not behave this way. So you have, to, yeah, that would be, yeah, that's an interesting part too. Yeah, um, yeah so uh, yeah, that uh, equivalence of the stationary points is interesting. I think there's another paper by maybe Jason Lee and Tengiwa and so on, which is also showing something similar. But my bigger question was- By, by whom, sorry? Uh, Jason Lee, Tengiwa and so on, very, very similar. But. Uh, and I asked them to, and they agree with me, but uh, I just wanted to put this out, that that doesn't imply that the two problems are the same, you know, because as I've been saying, trajectories could be very different, right? So you reach one stationary point for this and one stationary point for this, and they're very different. It doesn't mean that in practice they're doing the same thing, or even in theory. Well, um, that's what I said. You have, no, there I, are, I, there I, are I multiple minima. Yeah. But each one has these properties, right? Right. But when you optimize with this, you'll reach somewhere else. And with this, you'll reach somewhere else. Um, yeah, mm. may maybe. But I don't very think likely. it's so much the, um, uh, the, the dynamics are very similar. There is a row square term difference. 
um, the equilibria are the same. How do you reach them? I think it depends more on initial conditions than on a difference between the two techniques. Oh, oh, okay, yeah, I mean, but there's some difference, very likely, even with the same initialization, so. Yeah. Please come up and use the mic. Bias when you train the network. So, intuitively, how can we incorporate bias in the way that you train? So, then we don't have the, homo the homogeneous property. Can you repeat? Sorry. So, 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 I think that the, so basically the theory was for the case where the way we don't have biases, right? So, the yeah, this was without biases. Yes, yeah, so intuitively, what happened? Yeah, I, I, so empirically there is no change we can see. Yeah. From the point of view of a network, I think it's easy to have a bias in the first layer, and then at least from the point of view of approximation, you don't need a bias in the other layers because you can, the network will be able to have constant terms. And in the first layer, it's just a dummy variable. So, <laughs> so I don't think biases are a problem. Um, there's no others. Let's thank our speaker, Tomas, one more time.